Well, it's 12 o'clock. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Lunch and Lawn. Uh, this program is sponsored by the Fairfax County Master Gardener Association, which is a part of the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program. This is the fourth of six sessions to talk with you about lawns and weeds. This program is being recorded, and if you are not asking a question, we ask that you keep your microphone muted. My name is Al and I'm joined here today on a panel with Roseanne and Wendy. Now our program is divided into three parts. First, a quick introductory topic. Today it's lawn equipment maintenance with emphasis on fall service of your mower. Next, tips on identifying and controlling two weeds of the week. They'll be covered by Roseanne and Wendy. And finally, our panel will discuss lawn questions or issues submitted by the registered attendees. And at this point, we have six questions to address. Today's quick topic is on lawn equipment maintenance and why it's very important in establishing and maintaining a healthy and vigorous lawn. This first slide shows the issue of blade and your mower. Whether it's a lawn tractor or push mower, a sharp blade materially contributes to the condition of your lawn. A sharp blade equals a healthy lawn and a sharp blade gives a clean cut so your lawn will look lush and a dull blade simply tears the grass and leaves ragged tips as shown there on the right. Photo on the left shows the results of a dull blade cutting the grass and shredding the grass with tips that die back. On the right, you see the results of a dull blade in action. Your lawn will turn gray after it's mowed because the leaf tips that are torn and shredded eventually turn yellow or brown and die back. Equally important, the turf is weakened by mower blade injury and it's more susceptible to drought, diseases, and other problems. What's the solution? Inspect your leaf blade regularly, sharpen or replace the blades as needed, and avoid mowing under drought conditions or when the leaf, leaf blades are wet. We'll talk more about sharpening and blade replacement later, but it's recommended by most manufacturers to replace the blade at least once a season or at least sharpen it. We've established that a sharp blade is key to your lawn machine's performance and can materially impact the condition of your grass. Uh, let's broaden the discussion to include maintenance tips with regard to your machine. There are a host of mower types and sizes, so this discussion will be somewhat general and you'll have to look at your service manual for your mower for any machine unique items. While most mowers in service today are gas powered, increasingly bat battery powered machines are coming into the marketplace and gaining popularity. Now we're into the fall season. Shortly you'll be putting your mower away for the winter. So we'll talk about what needs to be done at the end of the mowing season, which is actually very soon. And it's an ideal time for mower maintenance because it's gonna be going unused for months. By performing maintenance and winterizing your mower in the fall, you're able to get moving first thing in the spring and less likely to cause damage to your engine or your mower from dull blades or malfunctioning parts. Here's a list of tips for lawn mower maintenance and we'll discuss each of them in turn. First of all, the spark plug. There's a safety aspect to this as well as an operational. You need to disconnect or remove the spark plug or the wire whenever you're working underneath your machine so that it cannot accidentally start. Most manufacturers recommend annual spark plug replacement. And in this photo, the spark plug is actually on my machine. Note it's not easy to get at and you need a deep socket to remove it. Also, you have to match the type of spark plug. Either consult your owner's manual or take the old one out, take it with you to the store to buy a replacement. A clean spark plug means quick starts in the spring when your machine is put back in service. Uh, the gas tank. 
you need to drain the gasoline out at the end of the season, either by running the mower's engine until the gas is used up or draining it out. So that you begin the new season with fresh gas and old gas can keep your motor from starting and gum up your carburetor. Cleaning the mower. Use a power washer or a hose to clean out the grass and other debris that's become caked on the undercarriage during the mowing season. In fact, you pr should do this periodically, at least once a month. Uh, this is an example of caked grass and other materials that I cleaned off my machine after about a month's operation. Oil. Replace or top off the oil. Now you need to consult your owner's manual on how to change the oil and the proper type of oil for your particular lawnmower. Most machines require SAE, SAE 30 or 10W30 small engine oil and it's available in most home centers. Uh, disposing of old oil properly is crit critical and most jurisdictions have some type of oil recycling uh, program, usually it's free. In this picture, most new mowers have a dipstick as shown here on the right. Older ones, you simply have a plug and you look in to see what the level is. When you're looking at the oil, if it's at the full mark and clear, that is not discolored, it's probably okay. Now the air filter, a key part of your machine. The air filter keeps dust and debris from entering the carburetor and if it's restricted, could prevent the machine from starting altogether. Now there's a host of different types of filters. The one shown here is a foam type filter, which can be cleaned, lightly oiled and replaced. Others are paper type filters and you have to simply buy a new filter and replace it. At a minimum, the filter should be replaced or cleaned at least once a year or more often, especially if you have dusty conditions on your property. Now we previously made the point that a sharp blade is essential for effective cutting and lawn health. You should sharpen or replace the blade even if your lawn is relatively clean of debris, rocks and foreign objects as the blades will wear down over time. Now you can sharpen or replace the blade yourself but it also can be done at a mower service by a professional and most hardware stores have a blade sharpening uh, provision for usually under $20, but you have to, of course, remove the blade. I simply use a small file as shown on the right-hand photo, and about once a month I turn the machine over, clean out the bottom, and file the blade cutting surface. You can also purchase a special grinding wheel uh, to put an electric drill that will do the same thing. Now there are a host of blade sizes and types. First thing you need to do is measure it, Check your owner's manual to make sure you buy the right size. Two things about undercarriage servicing. Always remove the spark plug before servicing. The motor can accidentally start. Another point on servicing the underside of your mower, when you tip it up, always have the air intake filter unit on the top as shown in this right hand photo. This is to prevent oil from running out through the carburetor. If that happens, you've got a mess. The carburetor is full of oil, very difficult to start, so always understand which way to tip your mower when you're working underneath it. Who should do the maintenance? You can do it yourself, but many people, especially with large ride-on mowers, depend on a commercial service to do an annual fall shutdown on their machine. The last consideration is winter storage of your machine. Yes, it's a machine and subject to damage from rain, snow, and harsh conditions. So store it in a dry environment and it'll be ready to go in the spring and it'll also last for years. Safety with your machine. As noted, whenever you're working on the underside of the machine, always disconnect the spark plug by either pulling the wire or actually removing the spark plug to prevent an accidental start. There are also personal safety concerns when operating your mower. First, noise. Always wear hearing protection. Uh, and the, that blade is spinning around and can launch rocks and debris, so wear eye protection. And don't mow your lawn in flip-flops. 
uh, wear proper shoes, even construction type boots as shown here. Many people have ended up in emergency rooms when they pulled the machine back over their foot. Uh, interesting, newer machines have a kill switch on the handle when you release the handle such that it shuts off the engine and that's very helpful and it's a very good safety feature. In summary, we have covered these major points that you need to consider to keep your mower in tip-top condition. With particular emphasis on what you need to do now in the fall to make it ready for a good start in the spring. Whether you have it done by an outside professional or do it yourself, it needs to be accomplished. Now, before we go into questions sent in by our guests, we'll hear about weeds from Wendy and Roseanne. Uh, Wendy, what do we need to know about Bermuda grass? Hi, Sal. Well, Bermuda grass. It's, some people love it and some people don't really love it that much. And so let me, let's talk a little bit about what it is. It's a wiry perennial and it's a warm season grass and it's got creeping stolons and rhizomes. The foliage is gray green to bluish green and forms dense mats. Bermuda grass, especially the cultivars Tough Coat, Mitteron, and Vermont are often used as sports turfs and those are the people who love it. However, if you find Bermuda grass in your lawn, it can be one of the most aggressive and challenging weeds to address. Some of the other common names for Bermuda grass is called devil grass or wire grass. <clears throat> Bermuda grass is a long-lived warm season perennial that spreads by rhizomes, stolons, and seed. Stems are leafy branched and four to six inches tall. The rhizomes are scaly and often form an almost impenetrable mat. Under favorable conditions, the stems may be 12 to 18 inches high and they're short jointed. The leaves are flat and spreading and the ligule is a circle of white hairs. Leaves may be hairy or smooth. The seed heads are usually in one whorl of three to seven spikes, each about one to two and a half inches long. Some robust forms may have up to 10 spikes in two whorls and it prefers full sun and can grow rapidly at air temperatures exceeding 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The seed heads are usually in one whorl of three to seven spikes each and about one to two and a half inches long. Some robust forms may have up to 10 spikes in two whorls. <clears throat> so what do we do about Bermuda grass? Let's back up one, Roseanne. Um, <clears throat> what do we do about Bermuda grass? So the cultural control is proper turf maintenance is the key to control of this weed. First select adapted turf grass cultivars for your area. And then properly fertilize based on the soil test recommendations. Mow and water to encourage dense growth. So mechanical control. Proper mowing is the primary and most effective mechanical control in preventing Bermuda grass in your lawn. Hand bowling or using an appropriate weeding tool is another primary means of mechanical Bermuda grass control in lawns. It's really only a viable option at the beginning of an infestation and on young Bermuda grass. Hand pulling when the soil is moist makes the task easier. Once established, Bermuda grass is exceedingly difficult to control and remove except by chemical means. So how do we control it with a chemical? For large areas of invasive, a post-emergent herbicide may be needed with the active ingredient of phenoxaprop or fluasopop butyl. Other consumer products that contain fluasopop, mesotrione, and topramazone can be used as recommended to control Bermuda grass. Selective Bermuda grass requires four to eight treatments per year, depending on the rate. These chemical controls can be applied in late spring when Bermuda grass produces shoots and leaves. It's important to note that long grasses may be temporarily injured when you are targeting Bermuda grass with these herbicides. Therefore, treat only in the spring and fall and discontinue treatments during midsummer. And be sure to read all the labels. Now, another chemical control is not for the faint of heart. You can use glyphosate to spot treat 
or renovate the entire lawn. If you go that route, your renovation should be initiated mid to late August, allowing time for reseeding in September to early October. Weeds must be actively growing in August when glyphosate is applied. To improve control, water well and allow foliage to grow a week or two before treating. Then apply the glyphosate at the rate recommended for your weeds and do not disturb the foliage or roots for a week after application. Water to encourage any regrowth and treat again if new growth appears. But be aware, chances are good that the Bermuda grass will return again in the future. New grass can be seeded seven days after treatment when you're sure the weedy grasses are dead. So where do you learn more about the Bermuda grass? We have a lot of information on the Fairfax County Master Gardeners website. Uh, underneath the Fairfax Gardening Home Turf section. Virginia Tech's another good resource, University of Maryland, and the USDA. I think next up is uh, Roseanne with Henbit. Roseanne? Yes. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion there. Um, Henbit is a winter annual, um, what we call a broadleaf weed, and it's a member of the mint family. So for people who are more organically based, they can eat that. Um, it actually got its name because chickens like to eat it. Um, but why are we talking about it now when it germinates in the fall? Um, because we talk about the winter annual weeds that we won't talk about, we won't see them till March, but now is the time when those little seeds from last winter's henbit are starting to germinate for 2021. So the seeds sprout in the fall and the early winter and remain tiny. And then when we have those short periods of warm weather in the winter months, the little seedlings start to grow. Then they can go dormant when it turns cold, but when it warms up again in spring, they start growing vigorously. So we start seeing them in lawns. Um, these little babies will happily take advantage of the tiny, the thin moist areas of your lawn especially those areas where it are shaded, like under trees and shrubs where grass has a hard time growing. This is ideal environment for those uh, weeds. And it's obvious, uh, sometimes confused with purple and dead nettle because of the similarity of the flower colors. You can see that um, it's got that nice little purple color to it. So we can recognize it because it has a square stem, okay? The leaves are kind of a kidney, heart, or round shaped with some scalloped edges. The uh, leaves are opposite along the stem and they're kind of tubular shaped. They can grow about 16 inches tall, but they usually sprawl across the ground. Um, they can also be confused with what we call ground ivy, also known as creeping charlie, which is a very aggressive weed. And we highlighted that in our last Lunch and Lawn program. Um, it's low growth also makes it difficult to, to mow. Um, so the upper leaves usually are attached to the, directly to the stem. The lower ones have a, a petiole or a tiny stem on them. And these tubular shaped flowers are kind of reddish purple in color and form usually in mid spring or so. Um, the plant usually produces up to about 2000 seeds so it can spread rapidly. And then it dies as the temperatures get hotter in the summer. And there's a picture of the purple dead nettle that kind of has heart-shaped leaves. So um, a little bit, you can see how it can be confused with those. So how do we control this? Culturally, in our landscape beds, we do apply about three inch mulch layer. The seeds will have a hard time getting through those. Um, as we've discussed before in the Lunch and Lawn program, if you maintain a healthy, dense turf, makes it difficult for the weeds to grow. They won't have any room. A soil test for proper fertilization um, is important to determine the nut nutrients and um, proper um, in the additions to the soil. If you have an improper environment that can favor growth, um, proper mowing height on your mower and the mulching rather than bagging, irrigation, aer aeration, all those things that we've talked about before are very important. Mechanically, hand pulling or weeding tool are best for control. As soon as you see those little babies, pull them out of the ground. Don't let them get a chance to get established. Um, and it's best done on moist soil on those young weeds. Chemical controls. Um, 
Use herbicides as a last resort and always be sure to read the label and follow the instructions because not all herbicides are good for all grass or all weeds. So you want to choose according to your turf species also. Um, Pre-emergent application should be in late summer or early fall. Active ingredients to include can be pendimethalin, prodiamine, oxidiazone. These are good examples. And then post-emergent application, um, some of the products that you want to look for, the active ingredients to include 2,4-D plus dicamba or mecoprop, um, triclopic, Triclopor or um, Panoxolone. These are good products, but be sure not to apply a pre emergent if you plan on overseeding because you won't get the um, growth that you want from the new seedling. Okay. You can learn more again from the fairfaxgardening.org uh, uh, website, the Pest Management Guide, University of Maryland, Penn State, Virginia Tech. There's a lot of uh, different sources out there to learn more about cannabis. So, Al, back to you. Okay, thank you, Roseanne. Uh, for more information on the two weeds that we've discussed today and a host of other pesky weeds, please refer to the Fairfax Gardening website as noted here under programs and home turf. And on the left, under the lawn and lunch weeds, there's a long list of the weeds that have been or will be discussed during these lawn and lunch programs. Uh, it's a handy reference and it might provides much more detail than we've presented here. So if you come up with, for example, henbit in the future and you want to know what to do about it, simply go to this uh, website and you can read the, uh, the detail on that particular uh, weed. Let's get into some cl uh, client questions. Uh, we're into the fall season that has influenced the questions received. We have received six client inquiries and we'll address each one of them in turn. And time permitting, we'll respond to items that have been sent in via chat and questions from individuals who have signed in. And any unanswered questions at the end of the session will be answered by email. Now, the first question is how to know if my lawn needs lime, fertilizer, weed control, and what do I reseed it with? And it's from Margo. And Wendy, can you enlighten us? Sure, I know that this uh, page is a little wordy, but we'll take it a, a, a little section at a time. So first and foremost, you need to do a soil test. And you can get the soil tests at your local libraries or reputable garden sh shops. And we need that first to determine the composition of soil and what is needed to help support lawn growth. Uh, so first and foremost, the answer, how much lawn do you need? The soil test will tell you, and, and it's determined by the pH. And um, it, 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 <clears throat> if the test indicates a correct range of pH, then no lime will be needed. Our program on A23 provided some in-depth information on soil sampling, and that's out on um, YouTube, the Master Gardener YouTube, if you want to go back and look for that. Uh, in addition, fertilizer, the, to answer the question about how much fertilizer do we need, fall is the best time. It builds a strong root system, and that allows the lawn to stay greener in the winter and green up sooner in the spring. Um, the next lawn and uh, luncheon lawn program will be covering fertilizing in more depth and detail. Nitrogen is a rich fertilizer that promotes green color and steady growth. However, nitrogen fertilizer has its own drawbacks. Too much nitrate will be flushed out of the soils and in runoff and will pollute water. Have you ever seen a pond covered in green scum? Most likely that's due to too much nitrogen fertilizer in the ground. Weed control. The best weed control is good lawn practice. Summer annuals are shallow rooted and they can be pulled up easily a pre-emergent can be applied in late March and early April to treat weeds before sprouting. For perennial weeds, pull them up if you can. Otherwise, a selective weed killer may be recommended, but also it may need to be repeated over several seasons. 
If you don't want to use a pre-emergent if you're reseeding the lawn, it inhibits, note, you don't want to use a pre-emergent if you're reseeding the lawns because it will prevent grass seed from uh, sprouting. So with grass seed, reseeding now is the best time. Most lawns in this area have blends of tall fescue, Kentucky bluegrass, rye, and fine fescue. So check with your full service garden center for the best choices with your lawn. Uh, the second question is from Pat, and it's noted here, and Roseanne, can you uh, fill us in? Definitely. Um, yeah. Steps for fertilizing and seeding, seeding now, plus applying corn gluten meal. Um, as we've discussed, uh, always have that soil test done. Be sure to aerate the lawn. It helps to bring more oxygen down into the seeds, help it um, reduce the compaction, so it allows for better uh, nutrients to to get further down and allow the seed to take um, to take effect. Okay, um, you want to apply your grass seed, but also apply a starter fertilizer because this helps with the germination of the new seed. Um, don't, but do not use any corn gluten when you're first overseeding because it does prohibit seed germination. And then you want to use a top dressing about quarter inch of fine textured compost. Um, one, one example of that is, is a leaf grow. Um, you also want to water the new grass lightly twice a day to help with that germination, um, depending upon the weather. If you get a little rain, that's good. If it gets too hot, maybe you want to hit it three times a day. It doesn't have to be a whole bunch of water, just enough to get it damp. Okay, and then you want uh, to apply a maintenance fertilizer, but not till about 30 days following the overseeding. Um, and at this point, corn gluten can be applied if you wish to add it. Uh, thanks, Roseanne. Uh, can you address the next question, which is from uh, Stephanie? Yes. Um, best way to reclaim easement from stilt grass so natives can thrive. And we talked about stilt grass on our August 23rd um, presentation. Um, so you want to grow alternative plants in the area, especially natives. Um, she's got a power line easement and septic drainage field choked with silt grass. So some of the things that have been suggested to date is pulling that, hand pulling the silt grass. And um, that's going to be a seven, several year effort because we know that stuff is very aggressive. Uh, annual ryegrass is a good uh, thing to throw in to help stabilize the soil as you're opening it up. Um, wildflowers, always a good uh, good way to fill in those blank areas and look into planting some of those um, the Northern Virginia natives that we talked about before. We know that this client has been in discussion with uh, Fairfax County about how to uh, reclaim this property and stay within you know, proper environmental guidelines, if you will. Okay. Um, some of the uh, native plants that have been discussed are the shade-tolerant grasses, um, some of the shade-tolerant perennials for flowering, and then also some ferns that you can throw in there. And so we've included on here, on this page, also, the link to the plantnovenatives.org site that gives you a wonderful list of plants and um, choices that you can use in your own yard. Uh, the next question is from Amy, and it's actually in three parts. The first part, I have a lot of crabgrass and other weeds and overtaking my lawn. And the first element is, uh, do I need to apply a weed killer before fertilizing and reseeding? That largely depends on the amount and type of weeds. If the weeds are annuals, such as crabgrass, they'll be dying off now because we're into the fall. Uh, however, if the lawn has particular problems, perennials such as wild violet, ground ivy, they don't go away on their own and they're gonna need to take a different approach. As a general rule, if a lawn has 50% or more weeds, especially tough weeds, perennials, uh, you might want to consider killing the entire lawn and starting over. 
Uh, Amy's second question was, how long should I wait between applying weed killer and reseeding fertilizing? Different herbicides require different times and wait periods before reseeding. And it sounds like a broken record, but we're always saying, identify your plant, read the label. Uh, some herbicides for broadleaf weeds, for example, uh, there's a waiting period of three weeks, while other herbicides will allow overseeding in one to 14 days. Read the label. Uh, know the active ingredients in the product, and then if you're not clear on, the uh, on what to do, seek advice from the outside. Uh, you can look on our website, or a, actually a good garden center usually has some experts that can help you out. The third element in her question, or can I fertilize reseed without applying weed killer? Well, generally, yes, but it certainly depends on the amount and the type of weeds. If you have 20 to 30 percent of annual weeds, they're going to die anyway. But if your lawn is like 80 percent of more of annual and perennial weeds, that could make overseeding uh, success more limited and may dictate basically a non-selective herbicide and starting over. This is the uh, fifth question from uh, Ann. Uh, we moved into a townhouse with an HOA last year. This is the second year they have aerated and seeded the lawns, but there's no plan for watering. Is it worth doing it? Well, basically, yes. Uh, new grass seed should most definitely be watered for the first three weeks. Keep the, keep the seeds moist, and that, of course, enables germination. This is unlike an irrigation watering. New grass seed should be lightly watered at least once a day, preferably twice, for the first two or three weeks, and is best in the early morning and late afternoon. And as I mentioned, this is unlike normal watering practice for older established lawns, where a single deep watering, watering of at least one inch per week uh, is adequate. Uh, the second portion of Ann's question, should one aerate every year, even if you do not seed? And this is a good question. Uh, first of all, soil will always benefit from aeration, but generally it's not absolutely necessary on an annual basis. Uh, however, lawns with compacted soil or soil with a high clay content can benefit from aeration, and we have all got plenty of clay here in Northern Virginia. And overseeding is not required. Uh, since the situation in the question pertains to a common area in a public setting, then, you know, there could be instances of additional activity, foot traffic, and that could increase compaction. Here's a good rule of thumb on soil compaction. It's called a screwdriver test. Yeah, if it's difficult to push a screwdriver into moderately moist soil, compaction needs to be alleviated and so you're a candidate for aeration. The sixth and last question is from Paul and uh, Wendy will address that. Yes, the question is, I'm not sure if it, I have Bermuda grass or Japanese stilt grass. It grows like crazy in the neighboring county land, but it takes over large patches of the lawn in the fall and it starts to turn brown in the fall. Uh, so we identified from this picture that the weed is, an, is nimble will and it is a warm season grass and it's a perennial. And it, does, it is very similar to Bermuda grass from its bluish green color, um, but it is a warm season grass and it will grow in the shade and full sun. It competes uh, best in moist areas, but is often found in dry, less managed turf grass areas. Nimble weed is a very common weed in Virginia. So your option is either to hand pull it or treat it with uh, mesotrione. Um, this weed, will be highlighted and discussed in greater length at our next Lunch and Lawn on October 21st. But as Al mentioned before, if you don't, if you don't want to join on October 21st, we, if you go to the Home Turf website, this weed is, uh, there's a document um, that outlines this weed in more depth and detail. Al? Well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes remaining at this point, so we can now move to some of the chat questions that have uh, been called in. Uh, 
or, or sent in. Uh, let me read the first one. Uh, this is from Mark, uh, two questions. Uh, I've seen reference to balancing the blade after resharpening. How is this done and is it important? I don't think my mower blades are bent. Also for do-it-yourself sharpening, what type of file do you recommend? Uh, let me address the, the balancing point and then we'll talk about the file. Uh, on balancing, you simply, when the blade is removed from the machine, of course it has a hole in the middle where the, uh, the bolt attaches to the shaft, you just, if you have something, a cone of some sort, you simply lay the blade on that cone and it should balance. If it goes one way or the other, it means that the blade is bent. Uh, if you buy that little sharpening device at a home center, it's a, it's a grinding wheel that goes in your uh, electric drill. It usually includes a small cone that you can just set on a surface, lay the blade on it, and if it balances out, if the blade is bent, you generally cannot uh, straighten it out and just throw it away and buy a new one. On the type of file to use, uh, I use about a six or eight inch flat bastard file. That's a single cut file. And you don't have to, more than a few strokes, you just take a nice even stroke, probably you know, six or eight, 10 strokes on, on the blade. And uh, that puts the edge back on assuming that you're sharpening it on a fairly regular basis. If it hasn't been done in years, uh, you're probably better off to take it, uh, either throw it away or take it off and put it on a grindstone. But if you're, if you're like I sharpen it every month, it just takes a couple of strokes, and, but it's only on the tip on that cutting surface, which is normally about maybe two to three inch piece on the end of the blade that actually does the cutting. Let's see what else we have here on chat. Uh, oh, we have another Bermuda question. Uh, and Wendy, perhaps you could address this. Uh, Bermuda grass, can you grow it intermixed with cool season grass or do you have to choose between either cool season or warm season grasses? Um, so I would say it depends. <laughs> uh, Bermuda grass, as I mentioned, is favored by uh, sports teams. So if, you ha if you're playing sports in the winter um, and the Bermuda grass kind of looks like it dies off, then I would probably say, yeah, you probably want to mix it. But if for your lawn, um, it will, it, if you have it in your lawn and you want it in your lawn, uh, it will look like it's died back. And so you will, it, you'll have this cool season grass green along with the brownish looking color of the warm season grass over the winter. So if you're okay with that, how that looks, and I would say that would be fine, but I would say it's definitely up to your preference. Yeah, I'll endorse that. Any type of uh, warm season grass, like, such as Bermuda, uh, you have to accept the fact that in the winter time, it's gonna be, it's gonna die back. Now it's, it's, a, it's a perennial, so it's gonna come back the next season but for five or six months, you're gonna have a, either a brown lawn entirely or at least brown patches in the lawn where the Bermuda grass uh, is located. So they're not mutually exclusive, but uh, it's, it's a decisional point. Uh, let's see, uh, we have another question here. We had a sugar maple tree two years old since planting with a new house so probably four years old, 15 foot tall that blew away in a recent storm. What should we plant? When, when should we plant a new one and how now before the winter and if not so until what time? Uh, should we wait till spring? Well, let's address that question and other, others can contribute uh, in two respects. Uh, a 15 foot trawl that blew over and had only been there a couple of years, I would guess that it needed to be staked and perhaps the, the, uh, the hole that it was put into, especially if it was put in by, the, by the, the builder, they dig small holes in clay, they dump the uh, root ball in, may or may not stake it, and there it sits. Uh, the tree is unable to establish a root system in that clay, 
And don't forget a root system balances the tree off so it doesn't blow over. Uh, so regarding timing, the fall is now is a good time to replant. Uh, there's no reason why you couldn't put a maple in the same spot, but dig a hole that's at least twice to three times the size of the root ball, condition the soil that you're gonna put back in. And if the tree is fairly tall, uh, this was 15 foot, it's gonna have to be heavily staked for a couple of years uh, if it's gonna take root and, and prosper. Anyone else wanna add any comments on that? I can add a quick comment. Um, yeah. maybe you might wanna consider something besides maple trees because sugar maples are not really strong trees. Um, what was the other thing I was gonna say? Okay, I forgot what else I was gonna say. Well, I, th I think one point is that, you know, sugar maples are not native to this area. I'm from New England and they do great up there. Uh, Well-drained soil, cold winters, and uh, we don't have either of that here. Any other oh, comments uh, from anyone? Yeah, the other thing I was gonna say is if you plant now, you get root growth. And if you plant in the spring, you generally get top growth. And, um, it's, it's sort of better to buy a smaller tree because it'll establish better than if you buy a great big tree. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, by putting it in now, you know, you, you, you'll get uh, some root growth through the fall until almost December here, till we really freeze down. And uh, putting it in in the spring, immediately we're into summer and there's a lot of stress on a tree. And putting in smaller, you don't have to wait for it to grow. Uh, it's gonna establish itself better. If you'll notice on most of the, the highway construction projects now, they've gotten away from putting in larger uh, plant material. They're putting in little wispy sticks. They plant two or three times what they expect to have at the end of the cycle. And uh, it's survival of the fittest because they're not, not normally watered. Any other comments on uh, on the tree replacement? There's some follow-up from Manish in the chat. Let's see what else we have here. I think there's any more chat. Uh, he was asking about the size of the hole, Al. Well, generally at least twice the size of the root ball uh, and, you know, we, if you're buying a tree, it's either going to be uh, wrapped in burlap and, and a ball of, of burlap, or it's going to be in a container. And you'll find, especially on the container grown trees, that the, uh, the roots are very, it may have been in there for years. So the roots are going to be very compacted and you're going to have to cut, uh, basically cut about three vertical uh, slices through the roots and spread them out. Uh, if you're getting a, a ball, burlap and ball situation, that's been dug up in the field. Of course, the roots have been cut, but it hasn't been growing in that ball for a period of time. So the roots are not, it's not usually root bound. But I like to go, especially here because of the clay soil, go to three times the size of the root ball, put in some good, you know, condition the soil and dig it down deep and give, it, give that tree a chance to, uh, to survive. Otherwise, the clay, you know, think of it, it's a bowl. You dig something that's an inch bigger than a root ball and you drop this thing in, you've put this thing in a clay bowl. And when it rains, especially if it's in a low lying location, rain just gets in there and stays there and it'll simply drown the tree or the tree will struggle to survive. I'd any like other, to add, uh, any, yeah. any other comments or I'm just looking down the chat here. Al? I think. Al? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, um, I'd just like to add on the sugar maple tree. Um, the follow up question was also how tall would you consider appropriate? And so if you go to a reputable uh, garden shop, they will help you pick out, you describe, you know, your property what your soil conditions are, 
what where it's going to be planted, shade, sun, and they will help you with uh, information on, uh, they even probably give you a, a sheet of paper that tells you how to plant your tree and um, where to plant it, how big to dig the hole. And some um, garden shops offer to come out and plant it for you. Yeah, most, most of the, the, uh, full, uh, the full service garden centers will have a tree planting option when you buy it. And uh, while that can be sometimes expensive, it's, it's a good investment because the chances of your tree surviving also, they're probably gonna give you some type of a warranty uh, on that as well. Well, we're just about at uh, our time limit. We want to respect uh, people's lunch hour and we'll try to keep these lawn and lunch sessions to 45 minutes. So I'd like now to summarize and wrap up the session. Uh, as noted, this lunch and lawn series will be running through late October. And these, these are our future programs. I think we need to go back one slide, uh, Roseanne. Yeah, note that on October 7th and 21st, and uh, these are the topics. And the past programs are listed. Uh, past programs are available on YouTube, and this program will be posted shortly. And these YouTube videos, as well as the Lunch and Lawn fact sheets on the website, are a great reference source for today's topics and all the other uh, sessions as well. Thank you for joining us today. You hope we found something that you can use right away to help understand what is happening with your lawn and how to manage the weeds you might be seeing. This is the uh, YouTube reference. And this is the, uh, you are, let's go back one more, Roseanne. Uh, URL reference. I think it's back one way. Yeah. Uh, these are the references for the uh, YouTube channel and for Fairfax Master Gardener. And the website has a searchable archive of many valuable articles and references for public use. Now the YouTube link for this program will be posted on VCE hyphen Fairfax County and not only are the Lunch and Lawn series on there, but there's a host of other uh, plant clinic related items. Uh, we want to thank Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Fairfax County Master Gardener Association for support of this program. And importantly, our next session is October 7th, and we hope you sign up and see you then. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.